this lecture series of Indian Phytopathological Society of India on the Platinum Jubilee on the occasion of 75th years of Ajadi Ka Amrit Mahosa organized by our uh, world most uh, popular society, Indian Phytopathological Society of uh, India, New Delhi. New Delhi. Uh, first of all, uh, I would like to thank our speakers, M.A. Rosman, ma'am, uh, for uh, our today's speakers, uh, lecture Dr. Ami Rosman, research leaders, mycology laboratory, uh, U.S. Department of uh, Agriculture, Westville, Maryland. Uh, thank you very much, madam, uh, for accepting accepting our uh, invitation in very short time uh, times uh, on the invitation lecture on the very uh, popular most popular uh, for the taxonomical lecture on the understanding and communications the cause of plant diseases uh, especially in uh, fungi fungi today on 23rd uh, february 2020 in india uh, thank you uh, very much man and now i request to to our uh, Dr. Prasant Jambulkar, sir, to welcome our speaker, today's speaker, sir. Prasant Jambulkar. Thank you, thank you Dr. Pramod. Uh, thank you. So it's a great day, I must say. Uh, we are uh, stalwarts of mycologists with us to bless us. So first of all, Dr. Amir Asman and Dr. Manavaji, sir, Charlie, sir, is also there um, in today's uh, lecture. So first of all, I will say good evening, ma'am, Dr. Amir Osman, ma'am, and good morning to all fellow scientists, distinguished uh, teachers, students from India. I feel very happy today to welcome all of you uh, in this Latin uh, Jubilee lecture series of Indian Phytopathological Society. It's a 26th lecture, and uh, today we have with us Dr. Amir Osman uh, as a speaker. He is a authority in the field of mycology, especially I must say, I could ask message. And uh, she has done tremendous work in her life. And she was uh, just before getting retirement, she was uh, a um, research scientist at Systematic Mycology and Mycology, Microbiology Laboratory at USD of Bellsville. And uh, it will be a great event for all of us in India to have a learning experience and to hear you from uh, uh, in this lecture series. So I most welcome you, ma'am. Now I'll request Dr. Pramod Gupta to introduce madam to our uh, audience. Yes, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, sure, sure, sir. Sure, sir. Uh, Dr. Uh, Ahmed Osman is recently retired from the position as a research leader of the mycology laboratory of the U.S. Department of uh, Agriculture and Westville, Maryland. Uh, see, sir, his positions for over 30 years uh, during that time, uh, she conducted research on uh, systematics of uh, uh, fungi of importance to agriculture, including uh, those causing disease as well as those useful in, in uh, biological control. And the most recently, she has worked on the issue of determine, determining accurate scientific names uh, for fungi following the change of use of one name uh, for fungi. And uh, she has published uh, more than 200 research papers in uh, international uh, journal. In addition, she served as a uh, president of the Mycological uh, Society of uh, America, America and received the honor of the uh, Mycological Society of uh, America, distinguished uh, and the my mycologist. Okay, well, now I welcome to our uh, Madam Amy Rosman to deliver your uh, lectures. I'm also requested to our, our, our party, uh, participants to like uh, ask a question in the drop, uh, drop box and also com comments in the online uh, this series uh, by in YouTube uh, by subscribing uh, an online se uh, lecture series. Okay, now welcome Ma Amy Rosman ma uh, to uh, deliver lecture. Okay, are we ready? Okay, thank you so much for the kind invitation. I'm very pleased to talk to so many people in such a far away place. Today, I wanna to talk about uh, understanding and communicating the causes of plant diseases, especially fungi. As you can see, uh, I'm happy to be retired, but I did enjoy my uh, work in mycology for for many years back in uh, Bellsville, Maryland for the U.S. Department of Agriculture. <clears throat> oh dear, it's not advancing. Oh, well, shoot. I see, oh, there we go. 
So today I want to talk about how we communicate about plant diseases. And uh, I think you've all had a lot of experience trying to identify plant diseases and then communicate those to other people. Well, the way we do that is to get an accurate identification and identify it by using the scientific name. So today I wanna to talk about scientific names. It doesn't sound like a very exciting topic, but it is very important. So I'm gonna go over really basic things about scientific names and things that are happening in the science of studying fungi. In addition, I want to emphasize how important it is that research be documented. When you find a new disease, you want to report it in, in some publication, most likely. It could be local, it could be national or international, but that report needs to be documented with a specimen or a culture in order for it to be true science. And science needs to be repeatable needs to be verifiable. So you have to put a specimen at or, and a culture or both in a place where somebody can find it in 10 or 20 or 100 years. People who uh, deposited herbarium specimens 100 years ago had no idea that eventually you'd be able to uh, extract DNA from those old specimens and find out what exactly what that particular fungus was, is. So that's what I'm going to talk about. So what information is there in a scientific name? Well, as my example, I've chosen Phytophthora infestans. I think everyone knows the, the fungus, it's not a fungus, it's an oomycete, Phytophthora infestans. So Phytophthora, I think you all know, uh, is the genus. So here's the word phyto means plant and flora means destroyer. So it's most likely that any species placed in the genus Phytophthora is a plant pathogen and is something that uh, we don't want for the most part. And then the species epithet is infestans. Well, the, the name infestans was given to this species by this author, Montagna, in 1845, and originally it was called Botrytis infestans. But de Berry, a few, some years later, in studying the cause of the Irish potato famine, determined that it did belong in the genus Phytophthora, and it still remains in that genus. So one of the things this illustrates is the principle of priority. The principle of priority means that whoever describes the fungus first and gave it a name, that name should be used. So you can't, if you discovered a fungus tomorrow, and gave it a name, but it already had a name, the earliest name must be used. Notice also, well, so Botrytis, I think most of you know, is an ascomycete, while while Phytophthora itself is an oomycete. So it had to be changed from the genus uh, Botrytis. Uh, it was also described after Montagna by Desmaziere in 1846, and he called it Botrytis phallax. Well, that was that was a later name, so we don't we don't use the name phallax. Uh, Casper in 1854 thought this species, Montagne species, belonged in Perinospora. Well, Perinospora is the downy mildews. And so it doesn't belong in that genus either. So it remains here in Phytophthora and Festans, where De Berry put it in 1876. And I think you all know it's the cause of late blight of tomato or serious diseases of potatoes and many other plants. So, um, so you need an accurate scientific name if you want to communicate about an organism that causes a disease, or you want to synthesize all the information that's known about one particular fungal species. Uh, names of fungi, plants, and algae are governed by a set of rules called the International Code of Nomenclature. Um, some people get very excited about these rules. <laughs> Most people don't. <laughs> 
but uh, they are important for having everyone follow the same guidelines, same rules. And every six years when the International Botanical Congress meets, small changes are made in the international code. But in truth, the principles, like the principle of priority, stay the same. So the principle of priority I've already mentioned, it means that the earliest name must be used. Now, if, if you want to know more about this topic and the code, and I, I actually would encourage everyone to read this paper, I don't know if you can see it, but it's in plant disease in two, from 2008, and it goes through the basics of the code and how fungi get named and uh, why name sometimes change. Uh, and I, I think it's one of those things that everyone who works with fungi should read. Um, one point I wanna make is that the code of nomenclature concerns naming of organisms or nomenclature, not taxonomy. Well, taxonomy is, has to deal with concepts of a species. So what is a species concept or what is the genus concept? That's a taxonomic issue rather than a, a nomenclatural issue. So names are applied to species or genera that someone has defined, an expert has defined, and then it's determined what the name is. And one example that you may have heard of uh, is concerns the genus Fusarium. Right now, it's, it is a topic of some discussion. <laughs> Some people think the genus Fusarium should be a very large genus with a thousand or more species in it. While other, and there's, there's some data to support that. While other people think, uh, think that it should be subdivided into different genera, and there's evidence for that too, biological evidence. But this is a taxonomic issue and it won't be resolved by the code of nomenclature. It will be, be resolved by people arguing, people, people discussing the evidence. One recent change in uh, the International Code of Nomenclature concerns fungi alone. Uh, for, men, for quite a few years, the code allowed fungi to have two different scientific names a name for the asexual state and a name for the sexual state. Because in many fungi, these two morphs or forms of the fungus look very different. And again, I'll use the example of Fusarium. Here's the, the genus Fusarium that produces many, many spores, canidia, asexually. And for many years, and indeed for some species of Fusarium, we still don't know the sexual state, but for some species we do. And it's, it's this form of the fungus, gibberella, it's an ascomycete, you can see here, assi, formed in a parathesium. These are little black balls that are, are pretty small, but they're very different from fusarium. So for many years, we didn't know that these two very different looking organisms were actually the same species. So the code allowed fungi to have two names. Well, when I started working, we would go out in the field and we would find this sexual state and we'd grow it in the laboratory and lo and behold, it would produce this asexual state that we already knew. And so that was very exciting. However, as the years, decades went by, we could connect these two, two morphs or we could figure out using molecular tools that these things were the same. And so we no longer needed to have two names for the fungi, for, for the same species of fungus. Uh, I, I've talked to students about this and they're very happy that they only have to memorize one name instead of two names. So, uh, so now scientific names are based on the principle of priority, regardless of morph. So the genus Fusarium was described before the genus Gibberella. Thus, we use the name Fusarium. Another example uh, concerns Diaporthy citri. Diaporthy is a 
canker causing genus and diaporthy citri causes a leaf spot or melanose on, on citrus plants. Here's diaporthy citri. Uh, these asexual states of diaporthy had been put in the genus Fomopsis, but with the change to one name, the ge generic name from Fomopsis is now a synonym of diaporthy. So there cannot be any accepted scientific names in the genus Fomopsis. They must be placed in diaporthy. So here, Fomopsis citri is now a synonym of diaporthy citri. Well, if you don't think this is really exciting, as most people do not, there's an easy way to find out what should be the scientific name of your plant-associated fungus. And that is at the databases at the US National Fungus Collections. And here's the URL for it. But really all you have to do to find it is to go into your browser and write US National Fungus Collection databases. And you'll come up with this database that I'm gonna show you today. Also, there are two other places where you can find uh, accurate names for fungi. Mycobank is one of them and also the index of fungi. But if you're just looking for a plant associated fungus, this is the best database because it's only plant associated fungi. And we have there's someone working there all the time to update those names to make sure they're accurate. Now, how did we come up with this database? Well, we were asked to do a project on the fungi that occurred on plants in the United States. Uh, this project had been initially, uh, was based on a book that was published in 1950 that had the fungi that occurred on plants in the US. And so in the mid 1980s, uh, someone came to us and gave us some money to update that book. We thought there would be, it would take us two years and there would be about 4,000 species of fungi in the United States. Uh, well, so, so as a surprise to us, there were actually 13,000 species of fungi that we could find reported on plants from the United States. Then it took us four years instead of two years. Uh, and this was all went into a database. There's 78,000 fungus host combinations 4,000 references, and it was published in 1989. It's a fairly large book. We always joke and say that it's suitable for small children at the dining room table if you need a, something to hold them up high or a, or a doorstop. But anyway, don't bother to buy it because all this data is available online. And when after this was published, uh, the U.S. Department of Agriculture plant quarantine people said, oh, this is, this is wonderful, very useful, but couldn't you do this for the whole world? Well, we were pretty tired from doing just the U.S., so we laughed, but then they said they would pay for, for us to start, at least start doing this, so we did. So ever since 1989, we, were, we have been entering more data about fungi reported on plants anywhere in the world, and it's all available to you. So here's the fungi on plants of Brazil, and they're all in that database with under their accurate scientific names. And all of this, these reports are based on the literature and specimens and all available to you. How do you get all this data into a computer? Well, you find some wonderful people who like to enter data into a computer and you tie them to their computer. So we had a cadre of uh, three or four uh, data entry personnel and they entered all of that data from the literature as well as the data from the specimens in the US National Fungus Collections, which, of which there are about 800,000, even more now. Well, this is what the database looks like. So once you get to that URL, you'll come up with this screen. And if all you care about is nomenclature, you can just look at the nomenclature screen and, and ask what for all the species of Phytophthora or, 
or all the species of a particular family uh, or all the species on a particular host. And it will tell you the accurate scientific name. Um, or, but there's also uh, fungi on particular hosts. So if you want to know what fungi occur on tomato in India, you can query that. Or you can look under the specimens. What, what specimens of, of occur from India are housed in the US National Fungus Collection. But what I think is most useful is this thing called a quick search. And that searches all of the databases at once. Uh, I'm gonna show you how that works. Well, there we go. Okay, so as an example, I've picked uh, Facidium lacerum right here. So the first thing you do is to enter uh, the first four letters of the species epithet. So in this case, that's L-A-C-E. And then you get a list of all the fungi that are in the database with, that have an epithet, a species epithet that starts with L-A-C-E. So here's our Facidium lacerum. And it will tell you what what the database has. You, it has an accurate scientific name here in the nomenclature database. It has 19 records of specimens in the US National Fungus Collections. It has six uh, reports of the, this fungus on a host somewhere in the world. And those reports are based on 13 literature records. And so here's what it looks like. Oh dear, the top is chopped off. Oh, or maybe I took this one. No. Hmm. Anyway, at the very top, there should be a, a nomenclature record that tells you what the accurate scientific name is, what the, um, maybe it's next. What the, a little synopsis where it occurs, it says in temperate regions, what the hosts are, it will say on conifers and the synonyms. And then you can look down and find out where it's reported. And it's reported on under, under the synonym. So in this case, you don't have to search for under the synonymous names because it will automatically give those synonyms, those reports on the synonym. So under this name, uh, it's reported from the Czech Republic on Pinus sylvestris. And here it is from India, which is a little questionable because most of the reports are on conifers. Here it is from Idaho, Netherlands. You can see all the places it's reported. And it's reported based on these literature sources. So here's all the literature that mentions Facidium lacerum. And here's the one from India. So if you thought maybe that one on acacia wasn't correct, you could find this piece of literature and look and see. It's sometimes we make a mistake in entering them. Uh, or, uh, and this is a case where you say we'd enter it accurately, but you still think it probably isn't right. You might wanna get the herbarium specimen or a voucher culture and check and see was this specimen accurately identified? And here are the ones in the US National Fungus Collections, all on conifers. So, so now you can see what a wealth of information you can get by looking in these databases. Well, now I wanna talk about why you should deposit voucher specimens and document your reports of new diseases caused by fungi. This is what the U.S. National Fungus Collection looks like. This is Dave Farr, who was uh, instrumental in developing these databases, looking at some specimens. And these are all the specimens. There are a lot of them, I can tell you. So you could uh, make a voucher specimen of, say, your, your leaf spot disease. So you take, pull some leaves off and uh, just press them the way you would make a, a plant specimen. Press them between newspapers under some books or in a plant press. 
take all the information you have, what it is, where you found it, Latin long is important, uh, the host, uh, the date, who collected it, and deposit it in a herbarium. And there are lots of good fungal herbaria in India, I know that. Then another thing you can do is deposit the living culture. That of course is, the, is a very valuable thing to do. There are culture collections that will accept your, your cultures in the Netherlands especially, but also I know India has some good fungal culture collections. But you can also make a herbarium specimen out of a culture. So here's a Petri plate full of a fungus and you can make a herbarium specimen by using a cardboard slide mailer. You just, the slide mailer has a little depression in it or you would normally put a slide, but instead you can put in some water soluble glue like Elmer's glue and then cut out a hunk of this um, culture and put it in the slide mailer and dry that and deposit that in the herbarium. So you can make a specimen or you can make a dried culture. Okay, why do we need voucher specimens? Here's one example. We used to call a lot of fungi Fusarium graminiarum that causes head blight of wheat. Um, but in, in recent years, we have applied molecular tools as Ed Ishmael well knows, who studied trichoderma, um, you apply multiple genes and look at the phylogeny, the relatedness of the isolates that you're looking at and see if how many different species they represent. Well, all of these species were once called Fusarium graminiarum, but you can see in this phylogeny and it's based on several genes, although I'm not going to that. Um, here is true Fusarium graminiarum, but these other species are, are isolates that were called graminiarum, but are not. They're closely related, but they're distinct, and they often have a, a distinct biology. So maybe this one occurs on wheat in temperate regions, and maybe this one is more common in tropical regions. I don't know exactly, but I know that graminiarum was a broadly defined a species and now using molecular tools, it uh, consists of at least 11 species. And so Fusarium graminiarum is what we would call a cryptic species. It means that they look, all of these look very similar, but with closer scrutiny, especially applying uh, molecular sequence phylogeny, they are actually represent many different species. So we, we, in the future, will want to know exactly which species you are working on. Okay, so I want to touch a little bit on species concepts and generic concepts in fungi that result in name changes. Names do change, even though it certainly would be nicer if we could just have one name. and and. You know, 100 years ago, there were only 13 species of fusarium. At least that's what the Americans thought. The Europeans were ahead of us in that one. Uh, and now there's thousands of species. So species concepts definitely change over time. So now I'll talk about diaporthy. Diaporthy causes a lot of diseases. I think most woody plants have one or more species of diaporthy associated with them. Diaporthy is the sexual state name, but now it's the name for the entire fungus. And the asexual name used to be Phomopsis, but now that name is considered a synonym of diaporthy. So as illustrated by Fusarium graminiarum, but also in diaporthy, names change when species concepts are revised based on molecular tools. Names have also changed with the move to one name. A lot of progress has been made in defining species and genera of fungi. Initially, uh, we used only one, one uh, regions 
to sequence to help define species. But nowadays, uh, one region just is not enough. We found that uh, more than one species can have the same ITS sequence. So it's very, and the ITS alone does not reflect the phylogeny of a group of organisms. So it's very important if you're, if you, you're going to start describing new species that you use a multi-gene phylogeny. You need to get acquainted with the group that you're working on and find out what, what different genes people are using to, for example, define a species of diaporthy. However, the ITS region is still used for two purposes. One is a, a barcode, a quick reference sequence, but also in environmental sampling. And if, if I were looking at all of you in person, I would ask you if you were familiar what, uh, with environmental sampling. But I'll assume you don't know, but it's, it's really quite exciting because nowadays you can take a crumb of soil, a gram of soil or a decaying wood and, and extract all of the DNA from that substrate and sequence the I, fungal ITS region and find out how many different kinds of fungi are in a very small portion of substrate. Uh, it's a little overwhelming how many different species can be found in a very small uh, piece of, of organic material. So the ITS is still used for the, that purpose. So back to, to diaporthy. So diaporthy, including Fomopsis, is a can canker-causing fungi and, and very, many other kinds of diseases. Well, uh, it for many decades, it had been assumed that uh, every host had a different species of diaporthy on it. And that, uh, so, so if you had that a host and there was a diaporthy, then it must be that species. Well, that just isn't true. As it turns out, some diaporthies can infect multiple hosts and other hosts can have many several different species of diaporthy on them. So unfortunately, it's not as easy as, as we wish it were sometimes. So, okay, so there were about 2000 described species of diaporthy, including Fomopsis. Uh, and now we started discovering that they're not host specific. And another big problem is that there are just not uh, major morphological differences between species. So in the US, some of the major diseases are stem canker of soybean. And I imagine you probably have some stem cankers, uh, diseases on soybean in India. And then blueberry canker is another uh, disease caused by homo uh, diaporthy. See, I'm, I'm remembering the old days. So let's look at diaporthy citrus, citri and other diaporthy species that occur on citrus. Now you're in India, so you might know these two young, young people who came and worked at our lab. They just did excellent work. They're from Sri Lanka. Uh, Dimu Manamgoda and Danu um, Uduyanga. And you might ask them to um, give a talk to your society sometime because they're excellent scientists. They worked with Lisa Castleberry, who is the molecular mycologist at the USDA, on this diaporthy citri that I'm going to talk about. They took all the isolates of, of uh, diaporthy from citrus and put it in, sequenced several different genes and made a phylogeny for it of, among all the diaporthies they could find. And I can tell you that at Beltsville, we have thousands of isolates of diaporthy. And here's what they found. Well, let's see what they did sequence if it says down here, ITS. Oh, I guess that's ITS, but I think they did other genes too. Anyway, so they did find that there was a species that included the type of diaporthy citri that occurred only on citrus. So here is the true diaporthy citrus, citri. 
and that you must, this group must include the type species. But in addition, they found uh, that some species from citrus were not citri, but belonged to these other species. Uh, one, here's one, Terra carpicola. Oh no, that's not on citrus, but here's citrus, one on citrus that belongs to this genus. And you can see that this species occurs on many different hosts. It occurs on citrus. Um, oh, I can't read all of those, but there, there's other genera that they belong on. Funiculum, yes, as one would expect from the name. Mm. Prunus. So several different hosts harbor this one species called Diaporthi funicula, named because originally it was found on funicula, but now it's found on many different hosts. And then here's another species, Diatosporella. So you can see that uh, you have to, nowadays, you really have to have molecular sequence data to identify a diaporthi. And here's what they look like, diaporthi. Uh, canker causing, it, it produces many, many asexual spores that you can see here. And sometimes you'll find a sexual state, but usually you find a, uh, the asexual state. It's fairly nondescript and they, uh, they do, there's slight differences in spore morphology between species, but you can see how variable they are, the sizes just in this one isolate that's illustrated here. So it's a difficult genus. But here's what are, is happening in uh, the species concepts in diaporthy. And this diaporthy, I, I say, I tell you is representative of many of the ascomycetes. Uh, they must, species are defined using multi-gene phylogenies. Uh, no longer can you just use one gene to figure out uh, what the phylogeny of the genus is. You have to use several genes, and increasingly, we are using whole genomes uh, and doing phylogenetic analyses of comparative phylogenetic analysis for whole genomes. Species may or may not be host-specific. We used to think that they were, and nowadays we're finding they aren't always host specific. Um, but one, one thing that is useful is that uh, we have now defined a barcode gene for fungi. It is the ITS region, although this region doesn't work for all groups of fungi. So you need to know what group you're working with. The elongation factor is another, another sequence that is often used. And with a barcode, you can um, blast to GenBank and get uh, an identification or at least a close to what you might have. And in diaporthy, interestingly enough, there are, it looks like there are fewer species, true species, than had previously been des described, although there's still quite a lot of them. This is not what is happening in many fungi. In trichoderma, there are many, many uh, species being described. These crypto species that I talked about, things that look alike, but using molecular data, you'll find that they are actually different species. So it gets complicated. Okay, so as I've mentioned, increasingly you need a good molecular sequence to identify important plant pathogenic fungi. Um, the molecular results often correlate with biology. So um, the one example I use in the paper is the honey mushroom, Armillaria melia. It used to be a, a very broadly defined species, uh, but on closer scrutiny and applying molecular uh, phylogenetic standards, we found that there are uh, nine or more species, and that they do correlate with uh, biology. So one species may be more pathogenic than another or occur only in New Zealand or certain parts of the world. So it becomes very important to define carefully a species, especially when we're trading so many agricultural products. 
So it, now we, it is important to sequence uh, fungi in order to identify them, find them. And then scientific names will change uh, in order to reflect the phylogeny of that particular group. Well, finally, I wanna talk about barcoding. Um, barcoding is something that relatively new, well, maybe in the last 20 years, the, it's called a barcode of life. Now we all have barcodes on our, our groceries and clothes and everything has a barcode on it these days. You may well be born with barcodes, huh? Anyway, but now a barcode of life is a tool to identify organisms. And uh, different groups of organisms use different uh, barcode sequences. A barcode is a short gene sequence taken from a standardized portion of the genome used to identify a species. So <laughs> there, there has been initiative, an initiative to develop a fungal barcode of life. And you can see some of the uses of a barcode. One, one example is connecting alternate states of plant pathogenic fungi. For example, the rust fungi that have many different stages and look that look very different. Uh, it's not always easy to determine that they are actually the same species. So here's M rust and uh, Vaccinia graminus, and it occurs on an alternate host of barberry and looks very different in its acial state. But with a barcode, you could determine if you sequence this fungus and that fungus, and they turned out to be the same thing you could figure that they that it was the same species occurring on different hosts. Uh, and ideally the DNA barcode is unique. Um, oh yeah, so then you, if you sequence the ITS region and blasted to GenBank, it, it might tell you what that particular fungus was. It doesn't always work because uh, some species are defined a little more precisely than the ITS can, uh, can distinguish. So it's not, you know, it's just not a surefire way to identify everything. There was a workshop to discuss what exactly which gene should be used for the fungi. Uh, animals have use a different gene and plants use uh, two or three different genes as barcodes, but in fungi, ITS works for the most, most groups. It doesn't work for oomycetes, so that's a slightly different case. And you could find out in the literature what the barcode gene would be, but here's the ITS region, the internal transcribed spacer region here between this small subunit and the large subunit. So I hope I've given you some idea of why scientific names of fungi change and how important they are in communicating about fungi. Species concepts can change, as I've shown, genus concepts can change. And then we always have the issue of the one name thing. But most uh, one na name issue was uh, debated and it was decided to move to one name in 2012. And now 10 years later, for the most part, we have determined which names to use in the case where there is more than one name. And by looking at the US National Fungus Collection database, you can figure out what, um, what the accurate name should be. One issue that even I do not appreciate as much <laughs> as, it, as it exists is this issue of undiscovered species. There are a lot of species of fungi out there. And when you discover a new disease caused by a fungus that you can't identify and it doesn't that blast a gen bank, that is not unusual. There are so many fungi out there that we have not discovered uh, and we will continue to encounter them. In the US, uh, when we have invasive fungi, they are often new species. So this is in summary, 
we've made amazing progress in discovering and understanding fungi. I think the molecular age has really, really opened our eyes about, about the fungi. Most of the time you can't see them, so we don't, don't appreciate how many different ones there are. But uh, now we can accurately define and name existing species. There are many, many more fungi out there. Scientific names are essential for communicating about fungi and solving the problems that they caused. And I should say also, <laughs> there are fungi that are quite beneficial in biological control. So I should say solving the problems caused by fungi or using them in beneficial ways. And finally, we do now have the tools to understand the role of fungi in agriculture and in the environment. And this is my little motto. I like to say, no fungi, no future. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Are there any questions? Yeah, thank you, thank you, thank you very much, uh, Madam uh, Guzman, uh, for wonderful, outstanding, uh, vibrant lectures. Uh, and uh, if uh, you really don't uh, care about the excitement of Norman Pletchers, but needs to know what scientific names uh, to us uh, use for the uh, plant associated fungus, so these lectures will serve to our uh, participants, uh, participants, uh, our members. Uh, and the students, uh, researchers, extension workers, and policy, maker, market, uh, policy uh, makers working in the field of taxonomy of fungi associated with the, uh, the plant uh, causing uh, disease, madam. Vibrant lectures, uh, madam, on the understanding and communications the cause of uh, disease, especially in uh, fungi, uh, ma'am. Sure, ma and now today, uh, today, uh, today, incredible uh, progress is there to identify species and uh, genre of fungi in this uh, this uh, series. And uh, now I invite to our participants uh, for uh, the for the discussion. Our uh, members is are also is there. Doctor Manora Chari sir is there. Doctor Nan Smile is there. Uh, so I request to our participants for the discussion. I think we can. Uh, very good evening, Doctor Rossman. It was it is indeed a great pleasure to listen to this lecture of, on the mycology. And as Dr. P. K. Gupta is saying that this this is this is, will will bring an excitement in the young scientists, especially I would say, because this mycology nowadays is being taken as a you know like when they have to sit in the microscope. So sometimes they have to they are really getting confused with that, and along with that molecular data. So now I, I think we have a very good uh, today, Dr. Manora Chariji, our top mycologist of our country is there. So I would request Dr. Manora Chariji. I think uh, uh, we can uh, listen from him uh, yeah. about the lecture. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, good evening, Madam Dr. Rasman, and good good morning to all of you, uh, Professor Pradhuba Sharma and others. Uh, Dr. Rasman, you have been an acknowledged mycologist and very senior and uh, having worked on ASCOM ISTs for such a long time. Really, it is a lifetime achievement for you. And you have discovered a number of new species and new genera. Kudos to you. Now coming to the discussion part, I have three or four questions to you, ma'am. Number one is, there is a, concept of estimating the fungi. Axworth and Lacking in 2017, they said that it may be up to 3.8 million of fungi, that is an estimate. But later on, in 2019, Wu et al, they said that the estimate of the fungi may be around 13 million of fungi. So, what is your opinion about these estimates? <laughs> well, there is some research that supports some, those, some of those very high numbers, but I don't think there's enough mycologists in the world to describe them all. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, I tried doing that myself by looking at the numbers of species we had in the U.S. National Fungus Collection, and I came up with about 1.5 million 
going group mm. by group. Mm. But there's some work on litter in Alaska and uh, I, where they took all the DNA and, and sequenced the ITS region and came out with thousands in each different host. So I'm afraid there are a lot of fungi. And my good friend, Gerald Bill, she says you should try to think like a fungus. Yeah. <laughs> and so he looked at leaf litter in the tropics and he, he tried to discover all the species in just one kind of leaf litter. And the, the graph of the increase in number of species just kept going up and up. It does kind of flatten out a little bit, but it keeps going up. And if you think of a leaf falling off a tree, a living leaf, of course, there's all those endophytes in there on, in the living leaves. And then as, it, as it's young and it gets older, and then it dies, and as it's dying, every stage has a different nutrient content in that leaf. So there's a different fungus at every different stage in that leaf. So that makes you realize why there are so many different fungi out there. So I don't know if I go with 13 million, but at least one or one and a half million. Okay. Then the second question is that, uh... You have done a lot of work in uh, ASCO Mycota and uh, again, uh, coming to this, one name for one fungus, different course I proposed in different times, but you know that there is a junk of anamorphic fungi, which are of asexual stages and how far as taxonomists, we are justified in deleting or saying that merging deuteromycotina with that of ascomycota or with that of mycota, when there are so many fungi, anamorphic fungi, without the discovery of any of the asexual stages. Yes, certainly like Fusarium oxysporum. Nobody has ever found a sexual state for Fusarium oxysporum, and that is an extremely common fungus. However, if you compare it with other species of Fusarium, look at its phylogeny, it fits right in there with all the other Fusaria. So we cannot, we can no longer think of them as deuteromycetes. We have to consider them ascomycetes who, that have lost their sexual states, or we just haven't found those sexual states. There's examples of taking a, an isolate of fusarium from South Africa and growing it in a petri plate with a fusarium from Illinois, and they mate. They form the sexual state. So I just think that um, we've moved beyond the deuteromycetes, and we have to accept that that most of the deuteromycetes are ascomycetes. How can we say that they, they have lost their sexual stage? What is the genetic basis for that? Well, there is, a, uh, there is a phenomenon that hasn't been very well explored that's called parasexuality, where an asexual fungus goes through the... the uh, stages of sexual reproduction, but, uh, but there's no se separate morphology for the sexual state. In, well, fungi have hyphae with cytoplasm and nuclei, and the nuclei can travel throughout the hypha, and then somehow while they're traveling around, they meet another nucleus and, and go through meiosis. Uh, and so I think that's why asexual fungi are so successful because they do go through parasexuality. In theory, an asexual organism cannot exist for a long time over, you know, geologic history, over, you know, millions of years, but they do. Is it an assumption? Do, you think, that, do you think that is an assumption? Uh, I know that they exist. They're, they're the molds and they're everywhere. 
No, we, it's true that we have not found the sexual states for all the fungi, yeah. all the asexual fungi, but we know what they evolve from, what they're related to. We just never found that sexual state. When I was a graduate student, I used to go out and root around in the bushes and look for sexual fungi, but not many people do that anymore. <laughs> uh, coming to the classification, recently there have been Eumycota, Chromista, and also Protozoa, Bigzomyces and Plasmodium phormyces. They have right. been included under uh, this particular uh, Protozoa. Whereas Chromista, yeah. they say that Umycota is also there. And uh, there is a feeling among the mycologists that they want to create Umycota to a separate kingdom. So are, you justi are we justified in uh, creating Umycota, Chromista, and then including, uh, 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 transferring this Myxomyces and others to Protozoa? So I think that's what the molecular phylogeny says. Well, first of all, wasn't it a big surprise that fungi are more closely related to animals than to plants? That was that was a surprise, but it did uh, it did explain some of the problems we've had dealing with human mycoses diseases caused on human caused by fungi. We can have had so much trouble finding antifungal compounds that don't kill the human as it kills the fungus. And that's because we, they're, so the humans and fungi are more closely related to each other than to say bacterial or plants. But then all those things that we have traditionally called fungi, we only call them fungi because they stay still and they, you know, like slime molds, they, they form spores, so we think they're true fungi, but in fact, they really are closely related to animals. So I, I, I think the more we look at these things, uh, the more we find that they are, are really quite different. The chromista, you know, evolved from algae, uh, not from other, not from the eumycota, the true fungi. So I think there's no question about that. Yeah. Lastly, I would like to say that um, many people have forgotten about aquatic fungi, and especially oh, chytrids. Yep. Especially chytrids, and also with reference to mangrove fungi. Hmm. So, what we should do? They think that there is no uh, economic importance related to these. Therefore, they want to divert their attention only towards pathogenic fungi. Are you? Are we satisfied as mycologists? No, absolutely not. No, we have to look at fungi in all the different environments because they're important. Well, just look at endophytes, endophytic fungi, fungi that occur in living plants but appear to not have any importance in that living plant. But now we're finding that endophytic fungi actually protect the plant from other kinds of diseases. And who knows, I mean, mangroves are very important and it might be the fungi associated with the mangroves that allow them to exist in uh, uh, saline habitats where they exist. So I, I, think, I think studying aquatic fungi, mangrove fungi is very important. Uh, while working with Dr. Webster, John Webster and with uh, Dr. Goose, uh, R.D. Goose and also with Dr. Hawksworth, I questioned this. That is, uh, with reference to some of these fungi, when we discovered the undiscovered fungi as a new genera, monotypic genera, then many of the journals, they ask, what is the perfect stage of this particular fungus? We, now you tell me, ma'am, with your experience, is it possible for us to discover the perfect stage so immediately and then uh, attach it to the perfect stage? <laughs> well, I don't really know. Um, I think there, there's a lot of surprises in studying fungi. It's never boring. You have to agree with that. <laughs> but I don't know really that much about them. I, I discovered 20 new genera and 82 new species, and 60% of them, they don't have any perfect uh, 
uh, monotypic genera and species, they don't have any of the uh, perfect stages. And in the last 10 years or 20 years I've been searching, I could not find a perfect stage for that. Right, but they had to evolve from somewhere. They have relatives. Are they ascomycetes? Yes, few are ascomycetes, few are ascomycetes. Yeah. Yeah, a lot, lots and lots of ascomycetes out there. Yeah, well, it's such a, uh, you know, a specialized habitat. So they could have very specialized fungi on them too. Yeah. But they, they came from someplace. Yeah. So thank anyway, you. Anyway, well, yeah, sounds like you've you. had an interesting time looking at those fungi. Well, thank you very much, ma'am. And you have given a very interesting lecture. And uh, as an experienced and acknowledged mm -hmm. mycologist, we are uh, grateful to you. Thank you very much. Many kudos to you. And uh, even at this age, you have been so resourceful to many of the youngsters and also. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. Thank you. You are most welcome. <laughs>
for me particularly, where I feel that today I am attending a, this a very basic class on mycology. And also uh, Dr. Manoharasari sir also interacted with you very nicely. And as we know, so because we learned the classification of fungi, uh, we studied Alexopoulos classification, Ainsworth classification, is that it ma'am? So now that classification is expanded like anything when this molecular basis added. I think it will go on this extending the classification. It will be very difficult to memorize as a student. Anyway, so my uh, question is that, uh, as Dr. Prasant also mentioned, that apart from this conventional taxonomy, this molecular taxonomy is there. And molecular taxonomy also really, uh, we have seen it is very sound system. So recently, chemotaxonomy also added. So what is your opinion whether chemotaxonomy will help to resolve so many complications in fungal taxonomy? Well, I know some people who have tried to do that, the folks in Denmark, um, looking at secondary metabolites, is that, is that the kind of thing you're thinking of? Yes. Secondary metabolites? Well, well first of all, let me address the classification thing. Uh, I, I don't think students should have to memorize classifications in much detail. I think if they know some basic outlines of the different kinds of fungi, that's good enough. And uh, I just don't, I just don't want to kill any students off with classification when the fungi are so, such an exciting group of organisms. Now about chemotaxonomy, I do think there's some usefulness to it because I know with alternaria they've ha they've had some success. But yeah. I think in the long run it's going to be genomics that uh, that we use for the most part. It's certainly we've seen it uh, do we've seen sequence uh, sequencing become cheaper and cheaper and easier and easier. Uh, over the last two decades. So I think the same thing will happen with genomics and that will, that will be what people use rather than chemo taxonomy. And ultimately it is genomics, yes, yes, yes. Yeah. And secondary metabolites will help only in the segregation of variants, especially on the same plant, if the, the fungus in different stages. Right. And then, and uh, yeah. It gets awfully complicated. Um, yeah, yeah, you know, people yeah. who study Aspergillus and Penicillium have tried to use that, and it depends on the circumstances, you know, the media, the temperature, the moisture. There's just so many variables uh, that the secondary metabolites aren't always um, the same unless you have very standard conditions. So those along are the- with, Along with the genomics, Marfa exam is also important, madam. Say that again. I, what I say is, along with genomics, Marfa taxonomy is also important. Absolutely. Yes, yes. Plus, they're so pretty under the microscope. Uh, yes. All, <laughs> all those fungi. <laughs> yeah, that is the first step. Yeah. The uh, undiscovered world. Yeah. So, my dear friends. So today we enjoyed a very, very excellent talk delivered by Amy Roshman Ma'am. So she's renowned uh, this fungal taxonomist. We are very fortunate to have her today in our platform. Ma'am, so the, uh, this is actually uh, our society, Indian Pathological Society's Platinum Jubilee Lecture Series is going on. So yours is the 26th uh, lecture. Oh so God. you, uh, yeah, so you, really uh, entertain us and also cooperated with our request. So thank you very much for giving your valuable time. And also in the odd time you are able to deliver, but for us, it is a normal time. We are in the office, uh, but you are at home. This is very odd time for you. So that's why we are very much thankful for giving the time. And so you share your experience and knowledge to our these people. So also the, uh, participants and attendee on behalf of Indian Phytopathological Society. So uh, 
we are thanking all of you and especially thank to Dr. C. Manohar Hazari sir for this uh, adding the more value to this today's lecture. Thank you. Also, Dr. Nilim Lashwan sir. Uh, okay, Dr. Dilip Lashwan sir is also there. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, because we must thank you. Could uh, reach to Dr. Amir Osman, <laughs> Right, right. Uh, thank you, sir. I'd like to request Dr. Osman to uh, to lend your expertise and experiences to young mycologists in India, many of whom, um, you know, will be interested to to correspond with you. I would help anyone who who emails me and try to answer their questions. Thank, thank you. you. Okay, well, thank you for the interesting questions, too. That was very fun. <laughs> okay, okay. Thank you. Okay. Namaste. Good night. Okay. Namaste. 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 Good night, ma'am. Good night. Oh, Good night. One question I have. Um, uh, okay, welcome. Me. Is, is Dimu um, uh, in Sri Lanka or uh, uh, working in, in another country now? No, they're, they're in Sri Lanka right there now. Oh, okay. I, I even had... I emailed her uh, if she would be willing to give a talk or things like that, but oh, yes. um, I didn't get any response. So well, send me it. an email and I'll I'll sure. make sure you have the correct email for them. Oh, okay, thank you. Thanks. Okay. Yep. Great. Bye. Bye. Okay. Okay. Thank, you so okay. thank you. Bye. Yeah. Bye. Doctor Lakshman, you are in Maryland only. Uh, I am in Bellsville, in the same Maryland. place. Doctor Rosman yeah. used to be um, when she yeah. was. Uh, Actually, uh, Dr. Rosman uh, hired me. She was the committee yeah. chair when I, oh, I just fine, got interviewed. Okay, okay. Yeah. Nice to meet you, sir. Nice to meet you. Sure. All thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, good night from here. Good night. Good night. <laughs>